and lawyers, guns and money. Guns and money <laughs> See, Melting robot sentry guns has to win the day over the kind of I mean aliens are good films as well, but it's all kind of suspense and uh, well 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 listen anyone ball. anyone who's joined this uh, this web show uh, webinar now uh, will have, probably the first phrase they will have heard is blood, spat, blood splattering there John <laughs> uh, so we better reassure them this is not uh, this is not a horror movie guide but uh, I'm here with John Bloor uh, this is lawyers guns and money the legal web show for business owners and we're actually talking about sequels film sequels uh, and John was mentioning that of his I've asked John to produce his, provide me with his top three, and I think you need to tell me them. I'll, I'll tell the audience now, John. Top top three movie sequels of all time for you. Uh, top three movie sequels, so uh, not in particular order of uh, preference, but uh, Empire Strikes Back, which is maybe controversial in Star Wars quarters. Uh, Aliens, which is why we were just talking about um, acid blood splattering. Uh, and um, 28 Weeks Later... Uh, I can one of Danny Boyle's um, fires. <laughs> well, I'm going to give you my three for what it's worth, and I, uh, I'm going to go for French Connection 2. It's, a, mm. it's an awesome film. That's yeah. my age a little bit. Toy Story 2, which, you know, I didn't think they could improve on the original, but I, it's just a brilliant, brilliant sequel. And, of course, of course, Godfather 2. You know, it kind of is most people's sequel list. But I have to say, that does change almost every week, so come back to me next week and it'll be different. Now, the yeah. reason for this... Perhaps your kids have watched Toy Story 2 600 times. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you're a little tired of that sequel. Now, the reason, the reason why we have a legal web show that is discussing uh, top three sequels is that we are actually producing a sequel here ourselves. Uh, this is John's second appearance with uh, Lawyers, Guns and Money, and this is uh, the M&A sequel, the, the, um, the buyer's cut, uh, if we can put it that way. John was very kind to join us and discuss um, how to buy, uh, how, sorry, how to sell a business from the seller's perspective. Uh, but we're now going to have a little look at uh, some of the key legal issues from the buyer's perspective. And um, John, thanks very much for, for joining us. John is a partner at Pretty's uh, Solicitors, a firm based in Suffolk and uh, Essex and John has been involved in, in numerous transactions of which I was involved with him on, on one. So very experienced in, in the cut and thrust of M&A. Thank you for joining us, John. Yeah, my pleasure. It's good to be back. Um, now, there's a number of issues that we, we'd like to touch on from a buyer's perspective. And we're, we're looking at this probably from the perspective of a business perhaps that's established and is looking to grow through acquisition, although a lot of these points will be relevant if it's the first time, uh, if, if it's someone wanting to buy a business uh, for the first time. But what are the, some of the key issues that, that crop up, uh, John, I'd like to cover? And, and I think one of the first ones that people get a little concerned about is, is the issue of shares or assets. Which of the two is the better option from a buyer's perspective? And um, I know it plays a, a big role in the negotiation, but just, just give us your view on, on the definition of, of, of what is the most important and how it should be played. Yeah, I mean, it's a perennial question. I've actually uh, not long ago this afternoon just come off a call with a client discussing exactly this question. And yeah, fundamentally, it's the situation where you have you know, the, bit, the business that you're looking to acquire is a limited, limited company, and it's simply the question of do you buy the shares in that limited company so that you end up owning that company as a you know, subsidiary to your existing business, or do you strip out the assets and goodwill and contracts and employees and everything else, transfer them across, and then leave the seller with basically a you know, the sort of shell of that company minus the, the business, and from a buyer's point of view, the number one factor in all of that, if you just look at it in a vacuum, is the fact that if you take the assets, then you can cherry pick the good stuff and the contracts that you want and all the, the assets and leave behind any of the nasty stuff. So if the seller and the limited company happens to have, you know, festering legal proceedings and disputes or, uh, you know, breach of contract claims or, or other sort of black holes, then obviously you leave the seller uh, holding those rather than taking them on and uh, yeah to be honest if that was the only consideration then you would pretty much invariably to buy go down that route um uh, unfortunately it's obviously not that simple otherwise you know from a buyer's perspective every deal would would just go down that uh, that road and there are factors which come into play which may 
me it doesn't work and <laughs> number one amongst those i suppose maybe the seller um will obviously have exactly the opposite view and will will prefer to have a clean break and to pass any nasty stuff on to you um but also there may be other reasons and uh, you know, the primary one of those is probably actually the tax treatment so you know it's something that any buyer will need to discuss with their tax advisors in in the specific case but there may be tax reasons why it's better to uh, do a share deal rather than buy assets and there may also be other sort of structural reasons so the most common ones probably that we come across are if you've got something like you know, leasehold property in that vehicle and we, we've done one recently where the effectively the business was a very valuable sort of restaurant business um, part of the key assets was a very at least of a very desirable location and it may in any case, if you want to do an asset deal, you're going to need the consent from the landlord to actually assign that lease. Whereas, you know, in most cases, if the um, you know lease sits within a corporate vehicle, then you can potentially buy the shares and avoid that avoid that issue. So factors like that, you know, will come into play on individual deals and and, and push one way or the other. And is, is it is it something that's regularly contentious, or is it something that generally gets gets swept up within the negotiation? Um. It, it can go either way. So we see deals where, you know, there's a clear reason why it really needs to be done one way. And, you know, in which case it, there's probably an acceptance by both parties that they'll just go down that route. Um, but conversely, yeah, I mean, we see you know, quite lengthy discussions on, um, you know, buyers pushing for assets, sellers pushing, pushing for shares. And we have seen, you know, in the recent past, the last couple of months, I've actually seen deals where from sort of heads of term stage to completion, you know, it's actually changed from, uh, you know, agreed as a, a share sale, moved to an asset sale, and then actually, you know, at some stage moved back again, although that is, is probably more unusual. Um, part of the issue, and we'll, we'll probably come on to this, but it's maybe not always as hotly contested as it might be. You know, because there are other mechanisms within the legal process which, which you know, adjust the risk and, uh, and make the difference maybe less than it, it might appear on the face of it. Mm -hmm. And and um, you mentioned also that the, the, the tax treatment is, is clearly a major f feature of, of the decision-making process. So again, it goes back to that perennial issue, John, of, of getting your ducks in a row before you before you go for, for any form of acquisition, I guess. Yeah, it does. I mean, we're talking from the buyer's point of view here, so I guess you know the buyer's going to be looking at things like okay, other tax losses or other you know tax assets within that vehicle, which mean they, which they would want to have the benefit of. And obviously, when you talk about getting the ducks in a row there, well, you know, part of that is taking tax advice up front to make sure that once that's integrated into your into your group, you will actually be able to take advantage of those in the way that you would you would want to. And you know, clearly, there can be some pretty technical tax issues around that which you're, uh, you, know, you need to take advice on. Great, great stuff, John. I mean, that feeds me a little bit into kind of deal structures and, and, and I suppose one of the kind of leading questions that anybody would have is, is in instructing a lawyer or any professional advisor is, is the value add really and, and, and the deal structure and, and what flows out of uh, the heads and, and obviously the path towards the completion process is where the solicitor's value comes through. So can you just give us a sense of, of, of where the solicitor adds best value and, perhaps just take us through a, a deal structure process? Yeah, I mean, I suppose it starts off with the question of, you know, when is, is the best time to, to get your advisors involved? And I think actually the best lawyers you know, are probably very flexible and, and responsive to what their clients actually need in the process. So, you know, we're looking at established businesses potentially here as purchasers. And it may well be that you're looking at someone who's actually a pretty uh, experienced you know, business owner, has done a few deals in their career and sort of knows what they're about. And obviously their requirements from their advisors are going to be slightly different to somebody who's, who's really just venturing in and, and dipping their toe into this for the first time. But I think in terms of general principles, you know, what I'd be looking for if it was me engaging a lawyer, you know, is someone who's obviously got the experience in terms of transactional and M&A work and obviously understands not just the sort of legal process and the, you know, what needs to go in the contracts, but also to market practice and, uh, you know, how that's uh, evolved over the, you know, uh, over the last few years. Um, but also, I think someone who, who will actually take the time 
to understand from you, you know, what the real value drivers are in a deal, you know, which bits are important and which bits are maybe less important, and really to focus, you know, focus their advice and make sure that you are, you know, not spending unnecessary amounts of time and legal fees on the areas which are, are perhaps of less critical importance, but making sure, you know, also that, that all of the key points are picked up and, and dealt with appropriately. And, you know, we see different approaches from that. Obviously, we come across a lot of a lot of lawyers day to day, and, you know, there are some who almost sort of will take pleasure in negotiation for negotiation's sake. And I think actually the most effective advisors are maybe those who, who are focusing on, you know, getting the deal done, making sure it's the right deal for the client, but, you know, ultimately getting that deal over the line in a way which is best for the client rather than, you know, scoring points or um, or getting overly drawn into negotiations on points which, which aren't necessarily that, um, you know, that, that critical to the deal. Well, it's, it's, as you know, uh, and we briefly touched on in the previous one, I, I have a particular issue with um, business owners, either vendors or, or purchasers, instructing lawyers and advisors who haven't got experience in, in, in deals because uh, I'm afraid to say that, that, that many people do take on the responsibility of, of advising uh, clients when they haven't got that experience, and it's absolutely critical. And it's critical because people with experience can see the tripwires a long way in advance. And, and, and one of the problems uh, with M&A work, Johnny, and no doubt you'll endorse this, is you can't spot the skeletons or the, or the problems that are emerging. There's a lot of cost goes in to trying to buy mm. a business. And you certainly don't want to be facing those tripwires after you've incurred a, a large legal or advisory bill. So instructing people who have genuine experience uh, is absolutely critical to get a deal through properly and cost effectively. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I would agree with that 100%. And, uh, you know, it's making sure that you focus your you know, energies and your expenditure on the right things at the right stages of the deal. So, you know, we, we talked in the prequel quite a bit about heads of terms, so I won't go over that again. But, you know, ultimately you want to be making sure that key deal breakers, which are going to mean you don't want to actually buy this business, are flushed out at that stage and not, you know, two days before completion when you've invested a huge amount of legal fees and other professional costs and, and obviously your own time and energy on uh, on negotiating the, you know, the deal through to, you know, almost to completion. Um, John, that's great. I'm going to just move on quickly to a couple of other items that, that um, always seem to emerge as issues when, when I was involved in, in some of the deals I was working on, um, because there's a bit of a grey area. I mean, Tupi, um, when you take on a business, you take on the employees. Uh, just headline headline issues there, John, about what, what the buyer should be aware of, that they're un, of, of the responsibilities they're undertaking from there on. Yeah. So the first point on on Tupi, and I suppose just you know to to uh, not not to assume that people necessarily know what that is. So it's basically a nice bit of a Euro, well, it came out of European legislation, and it's the transfer of undertakings, protection of employment regulations. And the first thing to know about these is that really they're relevant to asset purchases. So you know we talked about that structure on a share deal. They're not really relevant because you you buy the company, you, you know you buy the employees. Um, the Tupi regulations step in or kick into effect when you've got an asset purchase, and what they almost do is, is preserve that that kind of share purchase structure, whereby you you keep the employees, and they extend that across to an asset an asset purchase as well. And what it means is that if you buy a business, broadly speaking, then on the day you complete that sale, the business and the assets and the goodwill come across to you. And also the contracts of employment of the employees are also transferred across to you as the buyer. So you have to, you know, their terms of, of employment will be maintained. And also any kind of claims and liabilities that the seller has incurred in relation to those employees. So if they've, you know, dismissed someone just before the transfer uh, in, a, in an unfair manner, then potentially that comes across to you as the buyer and you are required to pick that up. And it, comes back to this point I mentioned earlier about, you know, actually the difference between those two structures are, are sort of less than they might be. And this is one of the big reasons why, because you can't just buy the assets and leave the employees behind. And there is a lot of sort of residual protection around this as well. So, you know, you might say, well, okay, I'll get the seller to make all the employees redundant the day before completion and just buy the business without them. Um, but unsurprisingly, that's also been considered and, and that will effectively lead to, you know, an unfair dismissal situation where, again, the buyer can't escape liability. 
And you do find, I mean, probably the, you know, the touches we're talking about here probably have a working knowledge of it, but you do on occasion find buyers who just you know, aren't really aware that this will be the case and are expecting just to be able to take the business and the assets free of, uh, of you know, any employees who may be hanging around. And you know, it's not unknown for a buyer of business to actually have a fairly unpleasant surprise when they, they realise that this does apply to, to them. You know, mm-hmm. Typically at the smaller end where they haven't had um, you know, the proper advice up front, but it, you know, it can be a, a serious issue. Mm-hmm. No, that's great. That's great. I know, I know um, once or twice I've been involved in, in a deal where, where they've actually sent in a management DD team because it, you know, it's such a crucial, crucial element of a business that it's, it's often worth just getting some heads up on, on some of the issues that might be going on in the background uh, of, of a business. Um, John, breaking it down then to, to, to due diligence, we've, we're getting under the bonnet of the business and clearly the buyer and seller are probably getting very excited about the prospect of, of completion. Um, yeah. just, just a couple of key issues that, that can or, or often do emerge within that process from the buyer's perspective. Yeah, I mean, to an extent you always go into you know, the due diligence process from the buyer's point of view, you know, not necessarily knowing what you're going to find. but. Um, Probably the sort of key issues that tend to come across, you know, tend to come out are quite often around sort of con, you know, the, the obvious things would be okay. There's a huge piece of litigation that no one's told us about, but actually that's relatively uncommon because you know most sellers are not going to think, oh well, nobody's ever going to realise this and they'll disclose it. So the t- stuff that tends to come out of the woodwork more actually are things that people haven't really considered. So we quite often see. You know, if you've got the business has got a really large contract with a customer, you know that there'll be terms within that contract which actually are unfavourable to the buyer, or you know potentially say that if there's a change of control of the company, that the that customer can terminate the contract. And it will be things which you know the sellers genuinely don't necessarily have on their radar as a concern because they know the customers. You know, there's no issue for them. They never, they probably signed this contract without ever reading it anyway, and it's sat in a drawer ever since. Um, but for you as a buyer, if the customer then says, "Well, hang on a minute, I don't really like this new person that's operating the business," and look here, I can terminate the contract, then you know you, you've obviously got real problems on your hands, uh, on your hands, and. I suppose the more run of the mill stuff are things like, you know, there's, it's not at all unusual to pick up some small, you know, employment issues. But we have in the past come across much more whole, wholesale, you know, large scale stuff. So we've looked at businesses in the past where, you know, inadvertently there's been a structure whereby, you know, they haven't been paying national minimum wage to a whole raft of employees for some considerable period. Not even necessarily because they're not paying them enough, just because of the way they've accounted for various different things. And then potentially you've got, you know, a very serious liability that you can inherit there as a, as a purchaser, you know, and if you maintain it, obviously potentially um, even sort of criminal liability. So there are things like that which sort of come out of the woodwork. But nine times out of ten, it, it's things which the sellers you know, maybe haven't really applied their minds to because they're not really an issue for them in the day-to-day operation of the business, but which are triggered by you know, the change of control and which could become an issue for the buyer. Well, I, I, I had a wry smile uh, on my face when you mentioned about um, contracts coming out of a drawer because there are certain owner-operated businesses where it's a joy just to find a contract. <laughs> the, <laughs> amount, the amount of businesses where, you know, for years they've been operating on a kind of gentleman's agreement and then suddenly they're at, they're at the point of sale or even point of completion and they suddenly realise they haven't actually got any, anything in writing. But uh, anyway, uh, it doesn't happen often, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it does happen. Um, and, John, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up, going back a little bit to this, this issue of value and, and, and cost, really, I suppose, which, which are tied in together. Uh, we often get approached at, at Lawyer Fair to, to kind of provide quotes and prices for lawyers to help with some M&A activity. And, and clearly there is a cost of bringing in the right lawyer, but there are certain types of, of deal as well where, you know, there, 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 where a lawyer is crucial to, to a deal, no matter how, how big it is. Just give me a kind of case study or a couple of examples where perhaps, uh, you know, a, a buyer could get by without a lawyer and perhaps where it's absolutely crucial to, to have one on board. Yeah, um, I suppose, and you'd expect me to say this, but I suppose my response to that would be that actually, yeah, there's always a cost involved, but it's always less really than the cost of, um, you know, of, of not getting the right people involved. But what we try and focus on actually is where, you know, and we appreciate, and I appreciate that, you know, buyers are getting are more and more, you know, cost sensitive. So what we tend to look at is, 
okay, if you have got a sort of fifty million pound acquisition, then probably legal fees are not going to be a huge proportion of the consideration you're paying. There'll be a lot of work to be done, and there'll be a substantial legal bill. You know, in in the sort of you know fifty, sixty, a thousand, or whatever it will be. But ultimately, it's not going to be a huge percentage of uh, the, you know of what you're you're paying to acquire that business. Obviously, as you come right down the scale and you get to your, you know, small sort of local businesses which are changing hands for a couple of hundred thousand, then obviously the cost sensitivity is much higher. And the issue we always come across is that actually you reduce the work that you need to do on the legal side, but ultimately a lot of the same issues are still basically there and the same work needs to be done. So you unfortunately get to the stage where, you know, the costs and the legal costs and other professional costs potentially are a much larger proportion of what the clients are actually paying to acquire the business and you know i think the honest answer and you know i'm not just saying this you know, as a lawyer but i think yeah honestly i would never really advise anyone to acquire a business without taking some legal advice what i would say is talk to your lawyers you know or your advisors work with them and try and get them to work with you in terms of splitting out the tasks and the elements of that deal which are required and trying to pin down the ones which are, you know, almost put them in as a list of columns of, right, okay, essential. You know, we need to know, for example, that we're acquiring all the employees and that they're, you know, we're not going to have any, any sort of litigation arising out of that. And then break it down into, you know, the areas which are either, you know, nice to have but not essential or where you can say, actually, we can do some of that ourselves. So, you know, we have clients who will say, well, actually, okay, contract reviews, we're happy to pick up that element of DD and we'll come back to you if we've got any concerns on particular issues and we'll, we'll do, you know, rather than you reviewing every single contract. And we're always, you know, we're very happy and, and keen to work with clients on that basis just to try and, um, you know, split everything out as much as possible and make sure that we're engaged to, you know, to do the bits of work which are adding some real value and if the clients are looking to reduce costs then obviously you know move away from some of the areas where you know they, they can effectively get away without it but it's it's always difficult because the trouble is there will be you know client people who watch this and say well actually i've built a business and there was no there were no issues and clearly that does happen you know you can sometimes get away with it but the trouble is you just don't know whether you're going to be one of the lucky ones who can you know, buy it and do it all on a handshake and it goes okay, or whether something's going to come back to haunt you. So, well, the, you phrase, know, the that, phrase there, the phrase there is getting away with it, John, isn't it? That, that's that's mm -hmm. the issue. Uh, you might be lucky. Um, so I suppose the conclusion of that is, you know, get get the right kind of lawyer, get the lawyer with experience, and and and, and if you need to, agree a tight a tight brief with them. Yeah, I think that's right, and uh, you know, coming judging by what we sort of come across in the market, I would say in, in some ways you're better using potentially an advisor who, who might look sort of more expensive from a headline rate, but reining them in and getting them to really focus on important parts than to, you know, get someone who gives you a quote for the whole job, which is lower on the face of it, but actually is, is probably not bringing the right expertise to focus on the important points. And it's just sort of looking at the overall, you know, transaction, but potentially missing some of the areas where you really need to uh, be properly advised. Well, it's certainly something we try and emphasise. Increasingly, we're going to, uh, as, as lawyer fair progresses, it's about the value and about the value add of a certain lawyer, and their experience is a, is a crucial part of that. John, listen, thank you so much again for joining us. I think I know that um, the going straight to number one in the charts of the best M and A sequel is our is our recent recording. Uh, so that that's great. Uh, what do you what do you call a third one if, if we do record a third one? Is, it, is there anything? Is it a sequel again? Yeah, I was looking at this when I was thinking about film sequels. I think they're just sequels. And I don't think, I think sequel is sort of anything after the initial ones. I think it's just another sequel. It is a sequel. It's not a triangle or a... a, a uh, no, I did have a quick look. I, I can't, I've never seen any other terms right, for right. it. So. I think I need to get on now, that. You, I think we can work on to a sort of a trilogy or a quadrilogy <laughs> yeah. or whatever it is. I'm going to get onto Mark Commode's website and see whether there is a definition for, for, for third and fourth edition. Listen, John, thanks very much. John Bloor uh, is a partner at Pretty's. Pretty's are based in Ipswich and... Uh, Chelmsford, and uh, it's, it's been a pleasure talking to you, John. Thanks again. Uh, this has been Lawyers, Guns and Money, a legal web show from Lawyer Fair. My name is Andrew Weaver. Thank you very much for watching. Lawyers, and lawyers guns and money. Huh. Uh. Lawyers, guns and money.